All right, let's test out this new spaceship. Oh, yeah, that's kind of cool. Oh, they, they, yeah, they're gonna like that. That's gonna be fun to play with. Oh. All right, that's enough. That, you know, that was pretty fun. That was pretty fun. Let's see, that was a good play test. What's, what's all this? Uh oh. Whenever you find yourself working on a game where you're spawning a lot of game objects, whether it's projectiles or enemies or special effects, you should usually start considering a more performant way of handling this. In our example in the intro, we were spawning a ton of projectiles or bullets. To play devil's advocate, we could add some sort of timer onto our projectile so that after a certain amount of time, these objects end up destroying themselves. And this is definitely one way of handling it, but we can do better. The problem here is that instantiating and deleting objects creates a lot of garbage, and this wastes a lot of computer resources when you don't need to be. This is where an object pooler would come in as a good solution. In a game like a bullet hell, 90% of the game is the fact that there are just tons of bullets going everywhere. You absolutely would need some sort of object pooler to keep your game running in a smooth way. There's no reason your 2D arcade shooter should be demanding on a modern computer. So instead of shooting bullets and having them destroy themselves after a few seconds, the idea is when the game starts, you instantiate a list of, let's say, 50 objects. So 50 bullets, and you disable all of them. And when you shoot, instead of creating new objects, you're taking an existing disabled object, setting them to your fire position, and then re-enabling them. That's object pooling in its entirety. So let me show you how to quickly set that up. First things first, we want to create a new C-sharp script. And we'll call this object pooler. Let's open it up. We want to be able to use methods from this script without making a direct reference to it. So in order to do that, one of the things we can do is make a public static followed by the name of this class, so object pooler, and we'll call this current. And we'll see how we use this later, but if you're completely new to this, just hang in there. We also need a public game object, pooled object, so this is going to be the object we actually are making a pool of. So in our intro, it would be the bullet. We can set a public int pooled amount. So we can specify how many to create at the start. And lastly, we need a public pool will grow. This will make more sense when we actually demonstrate how this works, but we can either set a static amount of objects to pool, and if you run out, then you can't use anymore. Or if you enable this pool to true, then it will make the list dynamic. Lastly, we're just going to make a private list of game object, and we'll call this pooled objects. In our start method, the first thing we want to set is current equal to this. And what this is, is an instance of the object pooler. And so we'll see how we utilize this later. We then want to make a for loop. So we'll say for int i equals zero, i is less than pooled amount, then i plus plus. And so at the start of the script, we want to instantiate however many objects are in our pooled amount. And we want to instantiate these objects, but we want to keep a reference to them. So we'll say game object obj equals to instantiate the pooled object. So we'll instantiate this object of whatever we pass in in the inspector, and we'll have a reference to it. And why we want a reference to it is so we can say obj.setActive false. So we'll disable it as soon as we create it. And lastly, so we can keep track of it, we'll say pooled objects, the list we made, dot add obj. So it'll add as many objects of this type that we pass in based on the amount that we specify in the inspector. That's it for the start method. We can get rid of this update method and instead say public game object, so we'll return a game object, get pooled object, in here, by default, we want to return null. And why we want to do that is because we want to set up two checks first. The first check we want to do is to find an object that's not active and return it. So we want to loop through them. And we can do that by doing another for loop. So for int i equals zero, i is less than pooled objects dot count, i plus plus. And in here, we'll do a check to say if our pooled objects at the i index dot active in hierarchy. We actually want to return a deactivated object instead of an active one because the active one is already being used. 
So we'll say if it's not active in the hierarchy, then we want to return the pooled objects at index i. To make use of this bool will grow, we'll say if will grow. So if our list is going to be dynamic, if it can't find a disabled object in our current list, then we're going to make one and add it to the list. And so to create another object, it should be familiar by now, we say game object obj equals instantiate the pooled object. We then want to take our list of pooled objects and add obj, and we want to return it. We don't want to send it back disabled because it will only ever reach this condition if we didn't find any disabled objects already in the pool. By the time you get to this point, you're already looking for an object to be enabled. One last thing, we defined this list of pooled objects and we're adding to it, but we never actually instantiated it. So before our for loop, we just want to say pooled objects equals new list of game object. Now this script is a mono behavior, so we need to attach it to a game object in our scene. A lot of people would probably use a game manager for this, but for the sake of this video, I'm just going to create a new empty object and call it object pooler. You could also attach it to a player or however you want to set up the architecture for your game is on you and your project. But for the sake of this tutorial and for clarity, I'm just going to throw it on this object pooler. And so I can take the object pooler script and attach it to the object pooler object. And we'll see our public variables here. We can fill this out. So I want to spawn projectiles. We could set the default amount to 20 and I won't set it to grow. And before we test this, we're not actually consuming this with our player and our projectile. So our object pooler exists, but it's not really doing anything at this point. With that said, it's clear what our next goals are. So let's make our projectile and player do just that. Let's start with the player because he actually creates projectiles. I just have a very simple player controller here. They can move left and right. And if you press down the left mouse button, then you're going to fire. And all fire is doing right now is instantiating a bullet and playing an audio file. We can delete this entire instantiate line because we don't want to be creating any objects anymore. What we want to say is game object obj. This is where that static variable is going to come into play. We want to say equal object pooler, so the class dot current, which is the variable we set up, dot get pooled object. For people new to programming, we're able to actually call an instance of this class and call the get pooled objects method from another class without having to set up a direct reference, which makes it easier for us. Now, it is possible for our object to return null here, and so we definitely need to check for that. Otherwise, things could break and you'll get an error message. So let's say if our object is equal to null, then we want to just return out of this method and not do anything else. But if we do find one, what we want to say is obj.transform.position is equal to our fire position dot position. If you've never fired projectiles in Unity before, then I actually made a tutorial, which I'll put in the card above, so you can check that out. Our fire position is where the bullets are going to be created at. And so we want to set the position, but we also want to set the obj transform rotation equal to the fire point rotation. And finally, we just want to say obj.setActive is equal to true. And that's it. We fetch an object, we set the position, rotation, and then we set it to active. Let's go into our projectile controller. And this will be even easier. Right now it's incredibly simple. When a projectile is created, we're just setting a velocity to it. We want to create a new method, and we'll call this disable. And in here, all we want to say is gameObject.setActive equal to false. So we're going to disable any object that this script is attached to. And we don't want to call this on start because that happens at the scene's beginning. And we don't want to do it in awake because that's when the game's loading. So there's another lifecycle method called void on enable. And since we're no longer creating and destroying these projectiles, we're instead enabling and disabling. Mentally, it's just a little bit of a different workflow. So in our on enable method, what we want to do is say invoke the disable method in strings. So it'll search the script for something called disable. And we want to do it in two seconds. So we'll say 2f. Lastly, just to make sure we're cleaning up all our loose ends and we're not leaving ourselves error prone, we need one last method of void on disable. And in here, we just want to say cancel invoke. Since we're calling a method after a certain amount of time, there could be some wonkiness. So this just prevents any weird errors from happening. And finally, the last loose end we have right now is we're currently only setting the velocity during start which will only happen one time, and this object's going to be recycled multiple times. So when this object gets re-enabled, 
it's actually not going to be moving because the velocity won't get reset. So you could set up the rigid body reference in a public variable and use the unity inspector. You could also call this get component call in the awake method instead of start. But what I'm going to do, which will help introduce the idea of checking for errors, is say if rb does not equal null, then we simply just want to set the velocity again. And so now our projectiles will always be moving when we re-enable them. And we won't have any issues with the rigid body not being initialized. All right, so when we start the game, you'll notice we have 20 projectiles spawning, just like we specified in the object pooler, and they're all deactivated. So when we start shooting bullets, we should see them start to activate. And they do. After all 20 get enabled, I'm unable to shoot anymore. The reason I can is because this is now a static list where you can only shoot 20 at a time until they deactivate. If you didn't want that type of functionality, you could just trigger the will grow. And so now if we try it, I should be able to just shoot bullets. And after I enable 20 of them, it will start creating new ones. Based on the rate of creating objects, you'll find that threshold of how many objects you can create. And you could set that to your static pool amount if you wanted to, but this also works just as well. That wraps it up for our object pooler. In our example here, we only showcased bullets, but you could also use this in a variety of other ways, whether it's particle effects, maybe you have a few objects that are really large, and instead of creating and deleting those, you would just create a few that you could reuse. I think using an object pooler every time you're spawning something is absolute overkill. Whenever you find yourself spawning the same object over and over, that's usually when it's a good sign to probably try and implement this. If you're using object pooling in your own way, definitely leave a comment, I'd be curious to know how. Or if you need some help, also leave a comment and I'll try and get back to you. If this video helped you out, then please give it a like, cause that helps me out. And lastly, for more game dev tutorials, be sure to subscribe. subscribe.